What do you sense? You sense saltiness of the tears. The tears of the puppies, they're salty. These are all things that you experience. What are some things that lots of people believe exist, but that you think don't exist? Maybe unicorns or mermaids or aliens. Um, anything else? I mean, depending on who you are, maybe also God. Right? Or it doesn't have to be types of creatures. These are all types of beings. It could also be places like Atlantis or something like that. Come up with one or two more on your own and then run the following test on those. There's something that I think is in common amongst all of these and that is that these are the kinds of things that you have not, at least, experienced with your senses. You're skeptical of the existence of unicorns in part because you've never seen a unicorn, or heard a unicorn, or smelled a unicorn, or tasted a unicorn. That's why you don't think there are unicorns. You went and looked, right? Or someone went and looked, and they didn't see any. And that's why we think there are no unicorns. It's the senses that we rely on primarily or at some fundamental level for knowing what there is in the world. This thought that you should only believe in the things that you can know about through your senses, we could put this thought into a kind of principle, a rule for what you should believe in. It might be something like this. Only believe in the existence of stuff that you experience. This would be a sort of rule that would get you your belief in mountains and trees and tables and chairs and other people, but it would, it would prevent you from believing in unicorns or mermaids or aliens or maybe God or Atlantis. A few notes about this kind of a principle. The first thing is about the word believe. We use the word believe in a bunch of different ways, different ways. So sometimes we talk about believing claims or believing propositions, right? You might believe that George Washington was the first president of the United States. In that case, you're believing that that claim is true. We're not talking about believing claims. We're talking about believing the, in the existence of entities. Okay, so. We're not talking about claims, not claims about unicorns, other than the claim that unicorns exist. We're talking about believing that claim, but primarily we're talking about believing in the existence of stuff, right? The other thing is just to understand that by experience, we mean experience through the senses. So Aristotle, who we talked about already several weeks ago, Aristotle was the one who came up with the five senses that we talk about. Sight, hearing, taste, uh, smell, and touch. There, I almost lost track of them. Those are the five. It turns out that there's more, right? Uh, Aristotle didn't know about this sense, but there's a sense called proprioception. That's your ability to tell how your limbs are oriented relative to one another. So even if you were in a vacuum, floating in a vacuum naked, no clothes on, nothing touching your skin, and your arms were like this, you would be able to tell how your own limbs were oriented. Um, and that maybe is another uh, mode of sense perception, right? A mode of sensory experience. Either way, we're talking about believing in the existence of things based on whether you experience those things. Okay, so we might have some principle like this. But this principle is not right. This can't be right. Only believe in the existence of stuff that you experience. Why? What's wrong with this principle? It's, it's too restrictive. 
it's going to mean that there are all sorts of things that you should believe in, but that you won't if you follow this principle. So what are some of those things? What are the things that you should believe in the existence of, but that this principle will tell you not to believe in? Things like, uh, I don't know. Is that how you spell Madagascar? Have you ever experienced Madagascar? If not, well, then this principle says you shouldn't believe that it exists. But it does. Madagascar is a real place, right? It's a real thing. It exists in the world. It's not like Atlantis. So this principle is too restrictive. Or another example is like, I don't know, a platypus. A platypus. You've never seen a platypus. You've been to the zoo, but, or in the aquarium, but you didn't get to see the platypus. But platypi are real. So this principle is too restrictive. You should believe in platypi. What do these have in common? How are we going to modify this principle? Well, we could modify it by changing it so that you can trust the experiences of other people, right? So maybe instead of only believe in the existence of stuff that you experience, we go with something like this. Only believe in the existence of stuff that you or someone trustworthy, other than you, have experienced. All right, that's our new principle. So now you can believe in cats and dogs. Those are real. You've experienced those. And you can believe in Madagascar and platypuses or platypi because someone else that you trust has experienced those things. Okay, and you're still not going to be believing in unicorns or mermaids or aliens. We'll get to God. Don't worry. God will make another appearance. This one too, this principle, this is probably also too restrictive. What are some things that you definitely should believe are real, you should believe in their existence, you're rational to believe in them, but that this principle would tell you not to believe in? Can you think of anything? How about like, I don't actually know if we can experience electrons or to what degree we can experience them with our senses, right? I mean, we can't see electrons, right? Because they're too small for light to reflect off of, right? Is that right? I don't know, okay? But there certainly was a time when no one had ever experienced an electron. Maybe that time is still now, right? But there was a time when no one had ever experienced an electron, but at that time, we still had certain information that made it such that it was rational to believe that electrons exist. So we need to get electrons, or things like that, right? Or gravity. Maybe some other things. So we're going to have to modify this principle one more time. Maybe something like this. Only believe in the existence of stuff you or someone trustworthy have experienced or that must exist in order to explain the stuff that we have experienced. So that's the deal with electrons. Electrons, there's a certain point in time, maybe it's now, where no one has experienced them with their senses, but that they have to exist, or they're very, very likely to exist, or the best explanation, um, their existence is the best explanation for the things that we have experienced. Like, that includes, of course, the readouts of certain uh, instruments or measuring devices right, that we use to tell what's going on at the microscopic level, or the subatomic level in the case of electrons. Okay, this is pretty close. We're getting somewhere. This seems like the kind of principle that's going to get you where you want to be as far as which things to believe in. Or this is one candidate principle. This principle we might call something like empiricism. And that brings us back to Hume, right? Because today we're talking about Hume. This is a video about Hume, about really only two paragraphs of Hume that we read for today. And Hume was an empiricist. He held, well, something sort of like this. This is a simplified version applied in a different way, but we're going to go with this for our purposes. This would be a perfectly good name for a principle like this. Why is it a perfectly good name? Where does this name even come from? Well, okay, the word empirical 
in English means having to do with or related to the senses or observation or experience, right? It comes from the Greek word empiria. That means in Greek, ancient Greek, of course, uh, it means something to do with testing or in test or something like that. But you don't have to remember that. We don't have to worry about that. Empiricism, as it's understood in philosophy, is, well, it's a view or a group of views having to do with trusting your senses or thinking that fundamentally the most important knowledge or the knowledge that we have does or ought to come by way of sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch, and maybe some other sense modalities. This is a kind of empirical principle about what to believe. Okay, by the way, now that we've changed this principle, now that we've added this stuff to the end, we might get back God, right? I mean, that's an open question. You're gonna have to take philosophy of religion to figure out if that works, but God might be one of those things that must exist in order to explain the stuff that we have experienced, right? There are certainly famous arguments for the existence of God that say that God has to exist because that's the best way or the only way to explain the things that we see or smell or hear or taste or touch in the world around us. Okay, so God might make it back in, but we're probably still going to leave out unicorns or mermaids, maybe aliens at least for the time being, until someone's experienced them, right? Or we've experienced something that only their existence could explain, right? And Atlantis also, no Atlantis. So empiricism seems right, or right-ish, or there's something right about it. It's plausible, at least. Hume is going to give us an argument in the two paragraphs that we read, an argument against the existence of morality or a certain conception of moral truth. An argument against that based on a certain empirical principle like this. So let's go through the first bit of the Hume that we read for today. Those are the first two sentences. Let's just stick with those before we move on. Take any action allowed to be vicious. Okay, so he's giving the reader an order or a direction. Consider an action that you, the reader, allow, that you think is vicious. Where vicious, well, vicious means relating to vice or having a vice. Pick an action that you think exemplifies a vice, an action that you think is wrong or a sin, something like that. Take any action allowed to be vicious, willful murder, for instance, willful murder, you know, purposefully murdering someone. Or an example that we might go with is something like, uh, you know, you got a bridge, where's the bridge? Here's the action, right? There's a bridge, you're on top of the bridge, right? There's a person, okay? And you're taking puppies, here's the uh, puppy, okay? And you're throwing the puppies off the bridge into the rocks below. Okay, a vicious action, throwing puppies off a bridge into some rocks, okay? Take any action allowed to be vicious, willful murder, for instance, or puppy tossing into, into rocks where the puppies will die. Take that action. Examine it in all lights and see if you can find that matter of fact or real existence which you call vice. Look at this action. Use your senses. Use your sight. Use your hearing. Use your smell and your taste and your touch and see if you can sense the wrongness, the badness, the badness, the vice. See if you can sense it. What do you sense? Well, here, let's do it. What do we sense? We sense, um, I don't know, brownness? Brownness is there because that's the color of the fur. 
uh, or windiness. Is that how you spell windiness? No, probably not, right? You, 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 can, you can feel the windiness on your skin, the wind, because it's a windy day. You can sense all of these things. Say also that you had a brain scanner. You were running a brain scanner on this person, the puppy thrower. And you could experience or sense the readouts. You could see and thereby read the readouts of the brain scanner. And it said what was going on in the brain, right? What would you find? Well, you'd find that this person was, you know, uh, gleeful, let's say. You'd find gleefulness. You'd find that they were perceiving what was going on. They knew what was going on, right? Some perception. They know that they're throwing puppies off of a bridge and they're happy about it, let's say. You've got that. You've got gleefulness. You've got this person's perception. You can experience that, let's say. You experience the brownness of the fur. You experience the windiness. The puppies are crying. What do you sense? You sense saltiness of the tears. The tears of the puppies, they're salty. These are all things that you experience. But notice that you don't experience the wrongness, the viciousness. Hume makes this point. You're observing something and supposedly you think that that thing is wrong. But when you experience that thing, when you look, where's the wrongness? Do you sense it? Here's what he says. So you examine this action that you think is vicious, that you think is wrong, and you look for the wrongness. You try to sense it with your senses. In whichever way you take it, you find only certain passions, motives, volitions, and thoughts. Look at this person throwing puppies off the bridge. What do you see? Well, you see the brownness of the puppy, sure, and the saltiness of the tears. You can experience that if you were really getting in close and investigating. And if you were really getting in close to the person who was doing the action and you scanned their brain or you cracked open their skull and took a look, maybe you could see an experience and then have evidence for the existence of, well, certain passions, certain feelings, certain motives or, or volitions, certain, certain willings. Right? Certain things that the person wills or wants or attempts to do or intends to do. Right? Certain thoughts. You could have experiential evidence for all of that. Right? You see what they do, you scan their brain, you've got lots of evidence for all of this stuff. So on this kind of a principle, you believe in all of those things. You believe in the saltiness of the tears. You believe in the brownness of the fur and the wind on that day. You believe in the thoughts and the motivations and the feelings and the sensations and the drives of the person doing the act, this evil act, this vicious act, all of that you can sense with your, with your sensory organs or you can have evidence of them, indirect evidence of them, that derives from what you sense with your sensory organs. But then he says, there is no other matter of fact in the case. There's nothing else. There's nothing else that you should believe in because of your senses. The vice the wrongness, the badness, the immorality. The vice entirely escapes you as long as you consider the object. That is, the object here is just the action. The action, the person doing the action. As long as that's what you're looking at, there's no wrongness. You can't find it. You can't experience it. And there's really even nothing else that demands that you posit its existence, that demands that you posit the existence of the wrongness or the badness. Here's the next thing he says. The vice entirely escapes you as long as you consider the object, as long as you consider the action, the thing, the action that's supposed to be the thing that's right or wrong. It's supposed to be the thing that's immoral, the act, right? Throwing the puppies off the bridge. You can never find it. You can never find the wrongness. You can never find the viciousness, the vice, the badness, the immorality. You can never find it until you turn your reflection into your own breast and find a sentiment of disapprobation which arises in you towards this action. The thought is, 
You're trying to find the moral property, the moral wrongness. Where is it? You can't experience it, not in the action. All that you experience, all that, all that you should therefore believe in is just a feeling inside of you, a sentiment of disapprobation, of disapproval. You disapprove of this act. Look, look at this person who's throwing puppies off a bridge. You think it's immoral. What is there that makes it immoral? Well, there's nothing in the act. There's just the fact that you don't like it. You have a feeling inside of you, a feeling of distaste or disapproval, and that's in you. That's not in the act. That's the only thing, Hume thinks, that you are justified in believing in, at least if you hold something like this, which, of course, he thinks, and maybe you think, you should hold some kind of empirical principle. Only believe in the existence of stuff that you or someone trustworthy have experienced or that must exist in order to explain the stuff that we have experienced. That's the only stuff you should believe in. That's why you don't believe in unicorns. And that's why Hume thinks you shouldn't believe in morality. Certainly not the kind of morality that exists in acts, that's out there, outside of you, right? You might think, look, this action is wrong, whether you're there to experience it and judge it and disapprove of it or not. But Hume says, no, there is no morality in the acts out there. And you shouldn't believe that there is such a thing as that kind of morality for the same reason that you don't believe that there are mermaids, which is you looked and you didn't find any. We looked in the oceans. We have fishing nets being dragged around the oceans all the time. You've gone out to the sea. Lots of other people who are trustworthy have done it and they haven't found the mermaids. And they haven't found mermaid houses and they haven't found mermaid uh, tools, or anything else that would mean that we have to believe in the existence of mermaids even though we haven't experienced the mermaids themselves. So we don't believe in mermaids. Same thing with morality. Don't believe in morality because you went and looked. You went and looked for the mermaids and they weren't there. You went and looked for the morality and it wasn't there. And you don't need to posit the existence, according to Hume, of morality out in the objects, out in the actions, in order to explain everything. You can explain everything that you think or say about morality just based on your own sentiments of disapprobation, of disapproval. That's all there is. There is no morality just like there are no mermaids. And we know this because we trust our experiences. That's Hume. Whoa, this grammatical mistake has been up there the whole time and no one told me about that?